Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College, and I'm very pleased to welcome everyone to our keynote address. Uh, unlike previous series, uh, we're, we're recording a number of our presentations to make available to our students and to make available to the general public. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Honors Lecture Series, it is both a class and an event that is free and open to the public. It's one of the courses that's required of our students who graduate from the University Honors College. It's a one hour class and it is a series that focuses on a different topic each semester. Just over a week ago marked the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, a milestone that we recognized back in the spring with our honor, Honors Lecture Series on suffrage and that our campus is recognizing throughout the academic year. This semester's Honors Lecture Series is focused on the topic of civic virtue, featuring a wide range of presentations exploring ways that we as citizens can contribute to the common good. I'm especially pleased today to introduce the keynote speaker of the series, Dr. Beth Harwell. She was the first woman to serve as the Speaker of the House in Tennessee, a position that she held from 2011 to 2019. She had a long and distinguished political career. In fact, I was one of her students back in 1988 when she was first elected to represent the 56th District in the Tennessee House while she was teaching at Belmont. Dr. Harwell ran for governor in 2016. Although she did not become our governor, we are fortunate to have her here at MTSU as a distinguished visiting professor. In her new role, she shares her expertise with our students and campus community by giving lectures such as the one she's going to give today and by participating in various events on our campus. Most recently, the, uh, the uh, Campus Civics Summit that's sponsored by the American Democracy Project. She is a true friend of the Honors College, and she is not only a gifted speaker, but a dedicated teacher. Uh, someone, and I can say from firsthand experience, that she's an excellent teacher and someone who takes real interest in her students as a mentor and as a role model. So today she's going to speak to us about the importance of public participation in civic life and provide us with some advice on how best to influence our elected officials. Well, thank you and good afternoon. I'm honored to be a part of this program today. Uh, pleased to be on MTSU's campus and grateful for a few moments of your time this afternoon. You know, our precious, wonderful Constitution guarantees us in the very First Amendment our right to petition the government. As citizens of a democracy, I contend it is not only our right, but it is our responsibility to participate in government. Of course, you know and realize that registering and voting is the most important first step. And I always in my years of teaching and here on MTSU's campus encourage young college students to register and to vote often. It's important for college age students to start the practice of being a voter during this time period. And I will have to say, having been in Tennessee government for a while, you have every right to participate because in a state that relies on the sales tax the way Tennessee does, you pay your fair share in taxes and you have a right to participate. I know sometimes voting feels like it doesn't really matter, but I'm here to tell you that elected officials are paying attention to who voters are. I remember when I was newly elected to the state house, literally when constituents would call me and ask for help or assistance in something, I would pull up my computer, type in their name to see if in fact they were, I was talking to a registered voter. So don't think it doesn't matter, it does. Unfortunately, I think after the voting takes place, a lot of Americans feel like they really can't or don't have a lot of confidence in their ability to influence what elect officials choose to do or not do. I think they see that there's a conflict sometimes with big campaign donors and contributors and special interest groups that somewhat dominate the political arena today. 
But I'm here to tell you today, citizens do have the ability to influence pol public policy if they work at it. And so that's what I'd like to share with you, some steps to take in influencing elected officials. The first step, I think, in influencing elected leaders is to understand them. Know that they have a lot to do in a little time. And that's especially true with state and local officials because most of them are part-time elected officials. So that means that they have jobs outside of being an elected official. I think that's a wonderful thing. I think it's what the Founding Fathers intended, a citizen legislature, so that they work and live in the district that they represent. They don't just visit it on the weekends, they live in their districts. They attend church there, they are members of the Exchange Club, their children are in the school systems, and so I believe that it, that's a wonderful opportunity for you as a citizen because you get to meet them in the district that they represent. I know when I was newly elected, and I know a lot of elected officials do this, is they look for a citizen's advisory team. You know, legislators are asked to vote on every subject from environment to education to transportation to banking. I could go on and on the wide spectrum that we're expected to know how to make a good vote. And so when I was newly elected, the idea came from someone I was representing. She came up to me and she said, I'm an elementary school teacher. And if you ever really want to know how the policy you set affects a teacher, I wish you'd give me a call. Well, that gave me a wonderful idea. And so I set up an advisory team across my district. So if an issue came up regarding accounting, I would call an accountant. Uh, if an issue, because the state regulates all professions. Uh, and so I would always have someone in each one of those professions that I could pick up the phone and say, how does this really affect you where the rubber meets the road? I would suggest that you could have an opportunity to be that person for an elected official, whatever your chosen occupation. Also, I think it's important at that level to develop a relationship with their staff. That's true at the federal level, the state level. Many times the chief of staff can make the difference of you getting an opportunity to sit down and talk to an elected official or not. So never discredit the person who answers the phone or takes your message. They have tremendous influence over the elected official's availability to you. Well, I think also a part of this is, is secondly, knowing that when it gets right down to it, every elected official wants to be reelected. And I don't mean that in a cynical way. I would never imply that they would do anything wrong in order to get elected, but I will tell you that they realize that getting elected comes down to votes and the public's opinion of them. So they really do care what you have to say. I often use this illustration that when I was an elected official, and especially when I was speaker, I would get tons of mail, emails, phone calls, etc. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it. A lot of those things weren't always read. But I'll tell you a letter that was always read and was always responded to by me. One that started out this way. Dear Representative, I am a registered voter in your district. I paid attention to those. So, I won't again sugarcoat it. It's true that people who contribute money to campaigns often have availability or access to the people that they've contributed to. But an informed, engaged voter can have just as much influence. Another illustration in my own personal life. When I first ran for office, I won the primary and lost the general election. I lost that general election by 31 votes. Now, if you'd asked me at the time, would you rather have $31,000 in your campaign account or 31 votes, which do you think I would have chosen? So that vote does always matter to an elected official. Third step I suggest when you have an opportunity is to develop a strategy and a message. You have to know your issue. Don't assume that an elected official will know what you're talking about. And for heaven's sakes, don't use jargon that they're not familiar with. You want to make what you present to them as simple for them to understand as possible. Again, because they have a lot of different ideas coming into them all the time. Tell them why it's important to you personally and to the working people in their district. Uh, I, I will tell you this, you have to keep it brief. <laughs> uh, my appointment schedule when I was in elected office, no one got more than 15 minutes of my time. So you've got to know what you're going to say. And if you're going with a group to present to an elected official, always know who's going to say what so that you don't stumble on each other and take up unnecessary time or repeat yourselves. Um, 
know, of, of course, look for other groups that might agree with you on this particular issue. You just never know when you can form a coalition and have even more impact. Uh, and I will say, sometimes there's unusual coalitions that can be formed. I remember we had a piece of legislation that had to do with privacy rights uh, in, the t in the Tennessee General Assembly and just how much the, the government has the ability to know about what you're doing, especially like with your children, etc. And it was amazing to me that I saw the Christian Coalition, an extremely conservative group, and the ACLU, some would label a liberal group, come together on that issue. And they would actually come into my office together, the two, the two individuals saying, this is why it's important to both groups, the whole idea of privacy and your right to it. So you never know who you might be able to find a coalition with and increase your impact. Well, right along with that, I would say, I think it's just as important to know who your opponents are going to be and what they're going to be saying. I remember when I taught uh, a full-time teacher, uh, I used to every semester require the students to do two things. The first was I may, they'd have a debate and they'd have to take a side on an issue. Say, for example, for the death penalty or against the death penalty. Large part of their grade depend on how they performed in that debate. So when they'd come in that day to present, you know what I did? You guessed it. I reversed it. If they had prepared to be pro-death penalty, they walked in the door. I said, today you're going to argue against the death penalty. Because if you don't know what your opponent's going to be saying about the issue, you really don't know the issue. <clears throat> and I will finish by saying that when you're with these groups, remember this. Compromise is not a dirty word. It's really the foundation of our nation. Compromise has been how this great country has survived. And so if you have an opportunity to work with someone that you don't necessarily agree on, perhaps there's a way that each of you can come up with a little bit of compromise and make it a win-win. I can tell you for a fact, elected officials truly appreciate that. And when I was speaker, I used to bring different groups together, whatever the issue. And if we couldn't resolve it, and they come to me for help, I would a lot of times just bring them into the speaker's conference room and say, you're going to sit in here till you work out a compromise, because I'm tired of you putting on the members on the spot trying to decide who gets to win and who doesn't. When you come to the Hill, I, I tell you, it really does matter that you bring some folks with you, that you show some strength. You know, a perfect example of that in the Tennessee legislature is something that the medical profession came up with. As I said, we regulate all professions. So we regulate the ophthalmologists, the optometrists, the medical doctors, the chiropractors, the physical therapists, all that comes under regulations of the state. And they all do have a paid lobbyist. And so you might think, well, the paid lobbyist has a lot more impact on those elected officials because he's the one that controls the PAC money, et cetera. But you know what? The doctors figured out a different strategy. And they had what they called Doctor's Day on the Hill, in which they, doctors are from across the state descended on the state capitol in their white coats. So when I was asked to go in and talk to what the Tennessee Medical Association wanted this year, when I walked in the speaker's room, I was expecting just to see their paid lobbyist. Instead, the whole conference room was full of doctors that lived in my district. Now, you tell me if that didn't have an impact on me listening and learning what was important to those, that profession. Always try to make an appointment if you can, because legislators' time is limited, and it's in an essence of you know, respect for their time. But if you can't make an appointment, and you just really don't want to have to travel to downtown Nashville, or Washington, D.C., or even City Hall in Murfreesboro, I will say that most all elected officials have what is known as a town hall or community meetings. Take the time to go to those. You, I think you'll really appreciate them. I know elected officials like when people show up. And, uh, you know, that's an opportunity for you to say what's on your mind and what you're concerned about. And if you see a spark of interest on in the part of the legislator, don't dominate the conversation. Instead, say, make, I make an appointment with you to talk to you about this further, either in the district or at your, at your capital office. Uh, that's a, another part of that that's really important is get to know your elected officials before you need them, before you need them. And you can have that opportunity to pick up a phone and call your local city councilman or your mayor or your state legislator and say, I don't want or need anything. I just wanted to call and introduce myself to you. And they will remember that and thank them for their service. They appreciate that as well. <clears throat> I, I will also say that if you have an interest in politics, 
Nothing will ingratiate you to an elected official more than calling up and saying, may I help with your campaign? They love when people will take the time to do a little something for them to help them get elected. And they don't forget. I remember clearly the people even though a long, long time ago that helped me with my initial first campaigns. If when you meet with them and present your viewpoints and your idea and it goes well, I would ask for a demonstration of their support. You know, elected officials can be experts at sounding like they've given you what you want, but you need to confirm that. Um, if they indicate they could support it, ask them to co-sponsor the bill or make a floor statement in its uh, advantage. Um, commit their vote some way publicly to you. It gives you the assurance that they're going to stick with you on this particular issue. Now, in fairness, I should tell you that when I was speaker, I actually told my members not to commit to legislation before they saw it in its final version. Because a piece of legislation can change greatly through the process. It can be amended at any point, and that might alter whether you feel comfortable supporting the legislation or not. So if they won't commit to you in that visit, short visit you have with them, I would do this. I would leave them with a one-page bullet point on why this piece of legislation or this particular issue is important to you. Make it big print because they're not going to go get their reading glasses to see it and make it short and to the point. And say, I'd like for you to review this and if it's all right with you in a couple weeks, I'll call back your office just to talk to your staff to see if you have any additional questions or can commit. And during that time, during that two week period when you're waiting to get back to, that's when you begin having telephone calls and emails sent from other people that support that same issue. Many a time when I was going in to vote on a committee, I would leave and as I was walking out the door, I would say to my assistant, did we get a lot of calls on X? And she would say, yeah. And I said, well, how many were calling in for it? And she literally kept account on most all the important issues that we were voting on if we got a lot of calls for or against. And that is something that legislators keep in the back of their mind when they go in to make a final vote. Regardless of the outcome of your co communication, always leave with being grateful for their time and thankful for their service. Because as my mama used to always say to me, you get more with honey than you do vinegar. And that is very, very true. Which leads me to a few don'ts I'd like to share with you. Some things you shouldn't do when you're meeting with an elected official. The first one just makes sense in all of life. You never mislead them. You never lie. Obviously, you're arguing for something, so you're going to be as persuasive as you, as you can be and say the positive things about the issue that you bring to them. But never mislead them or lie them because your credibility will be destroyed and you will not be welcomed back into their office. Take it from me, I know. Um, never make a threat. Uh, you should hold officials accountable for their actions, but never threaten their reelection effort. When you push somebody in a corner like that, they just get defensive and really shut off listening to you. And then finally, don't take it personal. Uh, there are going to be times that they just can't be with you on an issue. And if they're honest with you and tell you that, don't take it personal. Because in politics, I have learned there are no permanent friends, nor there are there any permanent enemies. So you never know when you're going to come back around and they might be able to help you with an issue that you care about. I would be remiss if I didn't briefly mention the committee system, and I think most of you are very, you know, somewhat familiar with our governmental structure. But committee systems in the legislative bodies, both in Congress and uh, at, at the state level, are critical. Committees just don't advise, they control the outcome of a piece of legislation. As I mentioned earlier, they can amend it. They can change it on the, on the, in the committee system. In fact, I had a rule of speaker, I wanted the, all of the amendments that we voted on to come out of a committee, not offered on the floor, because I wanted the body to have enough time to really understand what that amendment did and how it impacted the legislation. Um, there's much discussion that takes place in the committee. As Speaker of the House, I gave every member two committees to serve on based on their expertise and their interest level. And they develop knowledge on that particular subject. And so that's why they delve into the issue. All committee meetings are open to you as the public. And you can even at that point testify for or against something in public. And all that is recorded. And you can uh, watch that on the web. Uh, you never are allowed to talk on the House floor. You have to do all, if, as the public, the only time you're allowed to speak is in a committee system. And you simply call the chairman of that committee and ask for 
permission to speak. Of course, you're limiting your time. Um, and, but I will say, committees are critical when you think about influencing the outcome of a piece of legislation. So I highly recommend that if you have a piece of legislation that, for example, affects higher education. I know MTSU was involved uh, in trying to get voting locations on campuses. And that went through our, both our election committee and our higher education committee. And so it, those people that were interested in that, I gave them the opportunity to influence those committee members because that's where the ultimate decision on that bill took place. Keep in mind, a committee can kill a bill. And once a committee votes against the bill, it's dead for the session. You can't bring it back. So committees are critical. I'm asked quite a bit, does it matter that you sign petitions and send petitions into elected officials? Well, everything helps. But I would make the argument that I, along with like most people, some nice person comes up and asks me if I'll sign a petition. I probably haven't researched that issue a whole lot. But if I feel like I like the person, I say, well, yeah, sure, I'll sign it. Petitions don't carry the weight that an individual call or an individual email or letter would. Um, and so try to make it as individual as possible rather than form letters because elected officials say they know if they get a batch of emails and they all say the same thing that people were not as committed as they should have been to that particular issue. Finally, I'll about talk a little bit about the media and its influence. Uh, using the media is, is a good step because, of course, it works but you have to use it wisely. Uh, public praise and criticism will open and close doors, so be strategic. Uh, you, you think that the higher the profile is, the more impact it will have when it comes to elected officials, and I argue that's not always the case. Um, because I'll tell you, getting most all elected officials read their local newspapers. I always did. I used to read the Bellme News, I'd read the little Green Hills newspaper. Um, and I always read the, the letters to the editor. Um, so I think that type of influence in the media has more impact than having something published in the New York Times because elected officials want to stay close to their district and know what people are thinking. So work through your local newspaper to get something in there published about what you're concerned with. And they normally cover it. They're normally looking for news to cover, much more so than a TV station. Now, obviously, you like to have TV coverage. But TVs don't usually cover something unless it's got some background to it, some kind of activity, and they don't delve into issues the way a local newspaper does. So I would suggest using it. And a matter of fact, I was with Senator Alexander a while back, and he was doing what most elected officials was. He had clippings, and he was going through the clippings from all over the state, because that's how he keeps aware of what's happening in his state. So I would, um, I would really do that. I'm asked a little bit about paid advertisement, if that works. It, it can be effective, but it can also backfire. And I'll give you a personal example of that as well for myself. You may have recalled when Governor Haslam was trying to expand Medicaid in the state of Tennessee. Highly controversial because we have a very conservative state legislature, very worried about fiscal conservative. And uh, it brought out a lot of interest from people, I thought. And uh, what happened is the Senate, in a committee, voted it down. So it was over. It, it was over for the year. And so I didn't force my House members to vote on it because they told me they didn't have the votes in the committee and I didn't want to string them out on what was going to be a difficult issue. But some groups that were for the Medicaid expansion didn't completely understand how that system works. So they blamed me. And uh, they decided that they were going to come out after me. And so they raised a significant amount of money and put billboards up all over the state of Tennessee and saying, call Speaker Harwell, she's killing Medicaid expansion, and gave my number. I remember driving in on 440 from home to the Capitol that morning and saw this huge billboard of a picture of myself. And I went, oh no. I went into the office, I said, this is gonna be a tough day. I mean, we are, just get prepared, bring some extra staff in here to answer the phone. Well, guess what? At the end of the day, I said, how many calls we get? Two. So they had spent all that money trying to, to tell people to call in, but they hadn't done the grassroots groundwork of making sure those calls were going to be made. And it actually hurt their credibility tremendously. So if you're going to use paid advertisement, you're going to say contact your elected official, make sure you follow up and get that grassroots activity going. Or it made me look away saying, people are not as interested in this as we have been led to believe they are. Well, I could go on and on a topic that I love very much, but I'll just say in conclusion this. 
A combination of knowledge and personal commitment can make you a very influential citizen. And I know this is, quote is used oftentimes, but it is very true and so fitting for what we've discussed. Margaret Mead, who said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you so much for letting me share some ideas with you. Thank you.